think I have mine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me know if, I, if you can hear me. Um, okay, that's better. Well, thank you very much, Christine, for uh, your uh, nice introduction. Uh, I appreciate. By the way, this is my first time in, in Geneva. Uh, yesterday, when I was coming, I was so, uh, so excited to be here because not only that it's a place where uh, many good things happen, but I heard of the name Geneva when I was maybe when I was 15 years old in Ethiopia and in a refugee camp in Kenya and back in Sudan. The name Geneva, Geneva, it kept ringing all the time, and now here I am. So I am very, uh, very glad to be here. First of all, I, uh, my name is John Dow. Uh, one of the southern Sudanese, uh, which is the called the so-called Lost Boys of Sudan. We actually got that name from somebody else. I don't know who, who actually named us as Lost Boys of Sudan. Today, I'm not a boy. I'm a, a grown-up person, so, but the name is still there. But let me, I want to talk to you about why people call us Lost Boys of Sudan. I'm going to tell you by explaining a little bit my life story, how I become where I am today. Uh, it happened when I was 12 years old in our country, Sudan. Most of you do not know about Sudan. Sudan has been known by a few things. One, it's the, it the country that has been divided into two by the longest river in the world, the River Nile. Number two is the largest uh, country in Africa. Last, which is number three, is the country that have been actually fighting each other for many years. Wars started in, in the 18th century. Another war in 1955. That war in 1955 ended in 1972. Another war started in uh, 1983 and ended in 2005. Yet another war is going on now in our country. That the one was st started in 2003 in the region of Darfur and is still going on now. I'm going to talk to you about the war that started in 1983 until 2005. It had actually been uh, the war fought between the North and South. And what happened was that uh, the government, the successive government in the North, have been actually trying to kill anybody they can find. And so war broke out between the North and South. There was a rebellion in the South, those who have been trying to resist uh, the uh, mistreatment of the, of, the, uh, of the government. And so it happened when I was a little boy. 1983, I was a little boy taking care of my father's cows, no schools, taking care of goats, there was no school in South, in, in South Sudan, especially in the village I, I was growing up. And then, but the war didn't get to, to my village until I was 12 years old, 1987. This is when my village was attacked. And my village was attacked when we were sleeping. My brothers and I, we were, we were sleeping in our house. In the middle of night, uh, we were woken up by a whistling of bullets. The bomb exploded here and there. We woke up. We found ourselves outside. I was hearing my mother calling outside and saying, meet, meet, back away. That's a dinka statement, saying, children, children, come out. As we got outside, I saw somebody running across on my home compound, and I thought it was uh, my father. So it's the middle of night. There's no light. So I was running after him. As we were going through um, kind of some few feet, he dodged into the grass. And I was coming near, near him, uh, you know, kind of by him. He grabbed my arm and pulled me into the grass. All of a sudden, a long line of troops were coming shooting. So we kept quiet. They went into the village. We got back to, to the pass. A guy I thought it was my father was my neighbor, a guy called Abraham Degendiop. I was with this man for until the morning. And in the morning, I asked if I could go to see my parents, was, uh, all of my family members, if they were alive. Well, they said, he said that I should go with him. So we went for about uh, three days with, with nobody. 
And then later we met with uh, a woman with her two daughters. We became five. Later we were at Ambuch, and those one woman and her two daughters were abducted to the north. They were taken as wife or concubines, whatever you may call it. And then Abraham and I, we kept going. We, we were beaten. At some point, we were beaten to a point that I thought, if you see my body, you could see a lot of scars because of being beaten to a point that I thought I was dead. But that didn't, but, but I survived. At night, there's nothing to cover yourself. It was very cold. Honestly, I cry at night because just cold can, can uh, you know, uh, uh, take it. Daytime, it, it was just bit, a bit difficult. We ran into so many ambushes and being attacked by wild animals, and there was nothing to eat. Honestly, I still remember chewing grass like a cow, eating anything that we could find, wild fruits, so they would stay alive. Later, we... Um, we came to a place called Pibor where there was no water. We went for one day and a half with no water. Situation became so difficult. And so we start, uh, uh, others didn't want to go. Others want to die there. And later uh, we start drinking human urine so we stay alive. By the time we got to somewhere, some distance, we found mud. Mud is like mashed potatoes. We added, you know, it helped some of the boys, some of us. Remember, when we got into that situation, we were, five, we were two first and then five later. And then we became 19. And then during the, uh, that time, we were 27. So by the time we, we, we left that area where there was no water, we were only four, four of us. And the 23 of us died. And so we moved to Ethiopia. Uh, it's from my village to Ethiopia. It took us three months to get there. We got to Ethiopia, and some of the boys and girls were coming because in the north they announced that they have to exterminate or kill anybody who is a yeah, young boy so that they cannot grow up to join the uh, southern revolution. So we came to Ethiopia, two, three, four, five, and then we accumulated there. We are put in a group of 50. I was taller than the other boys, as I said before, I was 12 years old, but I was taller than the boys, so I was put in charge of 50. These boys were, were from age 5 to age 15. My group became 1,200 lost boys. These boys were crying every day. They say they want to drink milk, they want to see their mothers, they want to eat food. There's nothing I can do. My, myself and other boys who were older was trying to give them support. You know, today is bad, tomorrow will be good. And then it was another problem too because of uh, diseases such as cholera, typhoid, uh, measles, chicken fuck were killing boys every day. I remember in my own group, four, two or three boys dying every day. We took them, took their bodies to where we can bury them so that we can give our brothers dignity. When we come back tomorrow to bury the bodies of some more boys, we could find the bodies of those we buried yesterday in by hyenas or other wild animals at night. That was a very graphic part of life story. But we didn't give up. We kept pushing on. Later, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees came to Ethiopia to a place called Panyado. And then, other, and then the World Food Program, they came and they started bringing food. We stayed there. And then they started bringing uh, clothes. Uh, they give you a blanket. So if you had a blanket... Then you cover yourself at, uh, at night. And then at the daytime, you cover yourself with it too. Because everybody, there were no, basically there were no, anybody wearing any clothes, any piece of clothes. And so it was just good. And our life was getting better. Four years later, the civil war in Ethiopia forced us to go back to southern Sudan. And the number of the lost boys and girls and adults became 27,000. So we were there moving back to southern Sudan as we are forced to, to do so. But... But then we stop at a place called Gilo. Gilo is a river infested with a lot of crocodiles in it. The, the government of Ethiopia, which is actually the current government of Ethiopia, sent troops after, after us and started shooting at us. And some of us killed, others drowned, others eaten by crocodiles, others lost, others captured. We moved back to southern Sudan and stayed there 
for about nine months. The Sudan government knew that we were back in Sudan, and so they 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 uh, they bomb us twice every ever uh, every day. We duck some trenches so that when they um, so that when uh, they bomb us there, we will be um, uh, you know we we'll run into them. And so it was good. Uh, and then, well, some of us were killed. When it became really tough, because they sent Antonov. Antonov is a Russian-made aircraft that they, we knew the sound. Even right now, I can tell which one is Antonov, which one is what. So we, moved to the, we decided to move to the interior part of southern Sudan to a place called Kapoita, and then we were attacked there. In 1992, we eventually made it to another country called Kenya. Now, coming to Kenya was good because this is where I start to learn. A, B, C, D, one, two, three. Two, three. I never been to any school of any kind. And I started my education when I was 17 years old. It was just great, sitting under a tree, sitting on the dirt, using my fingers as writing A, B, C, D. It was just unbelievable. The United Nations also, agencies helping us, such as LWF, Lutheran World Federation, that's how it's called, UNHCR, IRC, which is International Rescue Committee, and then so many others, they help us. And then we now adore the United Nations agencies to become like our fathers and mothers because they were the ones supporting us with education, with food, with the security. This is where I started my education until 1999 when the American came to, to uh, uh, to uh, Kenya in Kakuma, Ravaji, Kenya. And it was just great. They were ta telling us they were taking us to America. We didn't believe them. Well, it was real thing. So uh, in 2000, they came back again and started taking us to America. Well, some of us actually say think that they know about America and the speculation about America. People start talking, especially the Lost Boys, and they actually been telling us, if you go to America, be very careful. American girls are crazy. Uh, they say it, how crazy they are, they carry small bag. And in those small bag, and my, brother, my uh, uh, friend asked, do you know what is in those small bag? We say no. Well, they have gun in it. If, if, if you mess up with American girls, they will shoot you. You know, I said, this is a country that uh, is very good and the women are killing people. Anyway, I, was, uh, I got my turn. I went to, uh, to, uh, to JFK, which is uh, New York, and then later flown in to, G to uh, Syracuse, New York, my current home. And then from there, I started working at McDonald's, uh, doing ditches and uh, doing a security guard. And then I transferred to, uh, to uh, I enrolled at Onondaga Community College, finished my CCA degree in 2004, and then transferred to Syracuse University where I finished my uh, bachelor degree. And I was so lucky to be in America. And then I said, well, I am in America. What can I do to my people? And that's why I start to build a hospital in southern Sudan. It has been operating now for four years. And I am now trying to see if I can bring agriculture to my people so that I can bring what I got from the United States to help my people. Look, I was not finished. Although I have been hunted down by my fellow uh, Sudanese in the north trying to kill me, Thank God, I am alive, and that, there is a reason as to why I am alive. And that is, I want help. I want to help my people, not always the West, that is supposed to be helping our people. I, in this situation I am, I am able to help my people, and that's what it's supposed to be. And uh, today, I am glad to be part of uh, this discussion. But there is one thing I want to remind all of you. Sudan problem is not over. It's going on in Darfur. It's still going on in southern Sudan, especially in a place called Abia. If you could please, as a human rights group, or was supporting this organization, war is not over. But let me tell you this. Without human rights, that would be writing about, I uh, mean, human rights group, that would be writing about our situation, None of us would have survived. I would say, say that. So the great work you, have, you, you start doing, and, and, and please still do that work. A BA problem is still there. It's not over. The problem in southern Sudan is not over. So I want to say that 
you know, you may not know who are you helping. If I was not helped by people like you and others, you know, things that I have done would have never been done. And you are there for the, as eyes of us, those who have been suffering. And so, and so many other places as uh, the name of the people are coming from, either China, Libya, now uh, uh, Egypt, and other places that uh, speakers are going to speak, they have the same problem. It's just that they are in different places. It's just that they are not African. But I want to ask you if you could support and make sure the problem of Darfur has, has come to successful end. And problem sounds it is not over. Thank you very much. Thank you.